A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 31 Their First Car The old Ford van wasn't suitable for a growing family. Further seating was needed. Living next door to Rita in Priory Gardens was the owner of the local garage in Sudbury. Terry told him that they were looking for another car and he came up with a red Vauxhall Victor which was only one year old and this seemed like a sensible buy. That car took Terry to work in Islington for years and the family on many holidays giving excellent service. During Sally's pregnancy with Rachel she learnt, leant over the settee and in doing so twisted the umbilical cord. This caused fluctuations to the blood supply to the womb. At one time we thought the pregnancy would have to be terminated but by taking things steadily, not exerting herself, the nine months would pass without another trauma. This time the baby was to be delivered at Edgware Maternity Hospital. At last Rachel was born on the 18th of May 1963, named after Sally's mother, Rachel Rita. The problem over that part strangulated cord did mean that the fetus had not had all the necessary life-giving oxygen and nutrients so that she was lighter than normal. However, she soon perked up and became the first girl in the family for generations. The family holidays were arranged for just a week at a time. They would spend the first holiday of each year at the Wymsey Hotel in Eastbourne. The YMC was run as a hotel, being directly on the sea front, in the middle of the town, which made it a perfect venue. They soon became familiar with what all the local facilities could provide, especially the best walks and sights. This annual holiday was eagerly looked forward to for many years. It provided full board at a very reasonable cost, and they made great friends with the staff, and they with them. Its size, its nooks and crannies, gave a lot of space for the children to explore, organise evening entertainments and entertain the other guests. The kitchen staff kindly laid on a special afternoon tea in the dining room. Terry was fortunate that he had three weeks holiday a year. For the other two, he planned walking holidays based upon either a farm or lodgings, mainly in the West Country. For each holiday, Terry bought an ordnance survey map and carefully planned each day's walk to take in as many archaeological points of interest that could be found, starting mid-morning and finishing mid-afternoon. They had to be circular so that they would never walk twice along the cer a certain footpath nor saw the same piece of landscape. All the walks planned to follow reasonably flat ground to allow for the pushchair and, if possible, take in a building of historical importance, mostly a church. Towards the end of each walk, the pushchair had to, be, had to carry at least two children, and quite often Terry landed up carrying the youngest, youngest tired soul. It was a challenge to come up with a walk every day for a week, and the family got into some difficulties when the map was either unclear the footpath not used sufficiently, the nettles and brambles were unflattened, or the path went through a herd of cows. Many times the marked stream had turned into a raging torrent. Perhaps the village shown on the map was either of a few solitary houses of devoid of any ha habitation at all. All this had to be done in difficult weather conditions, usually in the pouring rain, particularly when they visited Wales in the, in the Welsh marches. Terry was in the lead, being the map reader, while Sally brought up the rear. In between were strung out the children, who were enticed by the many and varied games Terry thought about along the way, with a prize of a few pennies for the winner. Nursery rhymes sung as a roundelay, as well as the alphabet, who can find the long, lo roughest stone, who can find the smallest stone, who can gather the prettiest posy, usually placed on the oldest gravestone in the graveyard. Our walks always included a visit to the church. The challenge was who can select the most varied group of coloured leaves, who can think of a girl's or boy's name beginning with each letter of the alphabet. In fact, he made up frequent quizzes and stories to make the journey interesting to keep the children occupied. And many times he said, it's just round the next corner. Terry made his answer so many times that it became a family saying. 
By looking at the map, he could now tell the ge geography of the place, whether fitting for human habitation, explaining why the houses were there and how built, why the farm was laid out in a particular manner, and the manorial th three-field system how a dry stone wall was constructed, a hedge laid and a ditch necessary, as many interesting pieces of information as he could include and a few more besides, in recording how past generations lived, trying to link the place with battles and knights in castles, how the walls could be breached and why the sally port was used. All went down very well. Terry's challenge was to read the ordnance survey map and draw a picture in words of the geography of the place so that the children could visualize the area before they got there. Much of the time his words were just a voice on the wind. However, he did hope some of it was sinking in, for he found it fascinating, especially when the walk took them round a castle, historic building or place of interest, cross swords notifying where a battle was fought or mound tumuli a burial. Every church admired or criticized for its architecture, every statue or niche inspected, the gravestones checked to see which the oldest and who could find the oddest name. They picked bunches of wild flowers placed on the grave. They all savoured the old-fashioned names and epitaphs. Their holidays followed this same old familiar pattern, with a packed lunch brought along the way to be eaten perched upon a rocky wall, gate or mound. The pushchair, the royal carriage, holder of all the unwanted clothes, after stocking up at the local shop, the source of comfort, comfort which would eventually lead to home, at least, at times it transported three children, two sitting, one standing, and even though it was a nuisance when having to be lifted over a hedge or stile, it went with them everywhere and never broke down. These more negative features, odd to an otherwise jolly occasion, needed a high degree of positive thinking on Terry's part. He had to impart sufficient joie de vivre to fortify not just the bedraggled, wet, tired, hungry masses, but Sally, who was still in the rear echelons, ab about to retire from the struggle. I am pleased to report that there were neither mutinies nor mass pickets the following morning. They all set off in high expectations after an injection of the exciting tales of daring do in the tribal lands. It was probably the thought of cheese rolls made in the back of the car which gave them hope and succour to be reached at an appropriate stage in the walk. Late in 1964, Sally decided once more on having another child. Terry was most concerned that the family's budget was already overstretched. Having another child would stretch it further. However, Sally insisted that they had ample bathing, baby clothes and all the other necessary things. And after all, it was four children that she had always wanted. With that, they agreed upon Terry didn't remember any such agreement, but if that made her happy, perhaps it would be possible. Now he really had to plan for an enlarged family. All the bedrooms were occupied. We needed more space, and the first thing was to put in a downstairs toilet. This would not be too difficult, because they had an existing understair cupboard that had been a walk-in larder. It had sufficient headroom, and luckily, just outside the small ventilation window was the soil pipe from the upstairs lavatory, and that could be linked into. The plumber, who was a friend, had a price for the job which was very reasonable, so they pushed ahead with the plan. The old larder window was louved and given, gave great ventilation and light. Now all Terry had to do was redecorate and put on a new door, which he built out of an angle, out at an angle, to give a little more space. Overall, it worked out very well, especially as they had fitted at the same time a new gas boiler and several new radiators. In 1964, there were a few loft extensions in the neighbourhood. The original layout of the roads, with their grass verges intact, the curbstones, and still complete without without driveways breaking up the sweep of the road's verges. The majority of houses retained their side entrances and complete front gardens. Few cars were parked, hedges abounded and front gates still existed. The roads were therefore neat, uncluttered and in the main unspoilt by alterations to the estate's original conception. The improved working 
factory working conditions and increased wage rates increased family incomes. Many women and wives were now working full time, which increased working class prosperity. The advertising and promotion of easy to fix home accessories and new power tools enticed many to improve and alter their homes. Television programs showed armored, armature home amateur home crafts being performed, home improvements given prominence in magazines and newspapers. All heightened the individual's will to behave better themselves. The countrywide do-it-yourself craze altered the architectural specifications of property throughout Britain. In the 60s, the emphasis was on simple alterations, to, to, a, and a decade later, more power tools widened the scope for building joiners, budding joiners and carpenters. Shops were opening up to loan tools and equipment, which allowed more ambitious exercises to take place. The country is easier, pla is easier planning laws allowed individuals to alter their property to cater for a car. Payments could be torn up, pavements could be torn up to create a ramp to cross pavements. Carriages built with a flat roof, although the brickwork had to be in keeping with the original specification. Lofts converted, front doors changed and window designs altered. These changes were made to houses all over Britain, affecting the original design concepts divided by the architect and town planners, the baby boom of the 60s and the ease of planning regulations and control gave parents a simple option. It was now much cheaper to alter your home than it was to sell and buy a new, larger version of the same. Children could carry on attending the same school, the routine of living unaltered. This made extending into the loft a far more attractive preposition. The appearance of Britain's town changed forever. Gone, green, calm, vistas and conformity. DIY ruled and cheapness the governing factor to design. <coughs> Distemper was superseded by emulsion paint. The public shied away from having green, brown and cream exterior woodwork, choosing instead new softer tones. Centre lights taken up to the ceiling. Net curtains frowned on. Privet hedges replaced by brick walls. Roads erupted with new driveways and lean-to garages sprouted. The old quiet charm of the thirties went modern. Kittens, kitchens were now fitted with everything beneath the worktop surface. The box freezer was the in thing. Fireplaces ripped out, chimney places bricked up, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting finished off the effect of uncluttered space. Gas and electric fires were taking the place of conventional fires for both heating the water and heating the living space. New do-it-yourself programs backed up all these alterations on television. This happened all over Britain, a, a situation where a vast proportion of properties were beyond the financial reach of certain sectors of the population. First-time buyers seeking affordable homes found less and less on the market. Mrs Thatcher sold off council homes and buying to rent was made difficult. Terry believed he could provide a better environment for his family if he relocated to the West Country. A larger house purchased in Somerset or Devon with the money received from the sale of Norwood Drive would be a better proposition than staying close to London. Part of the building could be let out for the holiday makers or as bed and breakfast accommodation. The possibility of a larger garden would provide a much better environment for the growing family. Excited by the thought of what the future might hold, he made plans about how to go about it. Sally appeared to be interested in the idea and could see the benefits. Terry contacted the West Country Union office and inquired about vacancies. One existed and he applied for it with a white card to receive back a request for an interview. Terry wrote to some of the local estate agents near Exeter and by return of post a sheaf of particulars looked promising. It was at this point that Sally said that she didn't want to move and this forced Terry to reconsider all his plans. One way to give more space was to open up the loft, and this led to a, another insurance po policy with Provident Life to allow them to have the capital to go ahead with a roof extension.
They also extended the kitchen sideways and redesigned the interior layout, constructing a little hatchway into the dining room. On his next holiday, he built a new patio, garden wall, and replaced the wooden fence with a brick wall, separating them from the next-door neighbour. To allow more space in both the second bedroom and the dining room, Terry removed the fireplaces and the chimney breasts. Tackling the bedroom first, he started to remove the brickwork, which came away quite easily. Where the breast came up to the ceiling, he racked back the brickwork to support the breastwork, beyond the ceiling into the loft. All surplus brickwork he threw out of the bedroom window and then wheeled them to the skip. When he came to the dining room, things were not quite so easy. The massive concrete hearth to the room above was still in the ceiling, unsupported. The concrete hearth was six inches thick by four feet long and eighteen inches wide. The question of how to get it down was a puzzle. At last he had a brainwave. He would lean his ladder against the wall and then hammer it down from the room above. As it slid down the ladder, he could secure it on the floor below. At the first twenty smashes, nothing appeared to happen. <clears throat> he could feel the house move, but not the slab. Not even a chip flew off. Terry assaulted the stubborn hearth with a massive block of wood, giving a most tremendous whack. That did it. It plummeted through the floor, straight through his ladder, which he was supposed to slide down, and buried itself into the splintered floorboards. Terry peered through the hole in the floor, aghast at the damage done. His new extending ladder, bought by his mother-in-law, was ruined. To remove the slab, he had to roll it head over heels through the French doors, up a sloping plank, into the skip. Now he had to plaster two rooms. It looked so easy when you watched a skilled plasterer laying on the coats of plaster, dampening down flicking water onto the drying surface to allow easy passage of the float to give the plaster a polished surface. What a performance trying to get it just right. In the end, he relied upon sandpapering succeeding coats of plaster to give the wall some semblance of a level finish. In 1964, Harold Wilson and the Labour Party were elected to take office. This was a time of industrial failure, out-of-date technology, short-term fixes which propelled the country into yet another sterling crisis and inflation. Off the country went again, into the annual wage demand to keep up with the cost of living. Wilson stepped back from trade union reform. Talking amongst themselves at work, Terry could tell there were high expectations sought from life. Individuals spoke about flying to the Far East or America. There was much talk about going out to restaurants and nightclubs. New towns were springing up all over the country. Men at work told stories about weekend parties and the swapping of front door keys. All sorts of choices in lifestyles were possible and there were shops and stores which catered for any deviant behaviour.